The concept of the smart home has revolutionized how we live in our homes and apartments by adding automation to tasks such as climate control, appliance control, even control of entertainment systems and lighting. In this lecture, we'll dive deeper into this ecosystem and we'll use our Raspberry Pis to create our very own smart doorbell. Welcome everyone to part one of our multi-part lecture on the smart doorbell. This will be part one and I'll be following up in successive days with other parts of this uh, lecture. So be sure to check back regularly for the next steps. Let's go ahead and get started. In terms of requirements for this lecture, we're going to use our Raspberry Pi plus the camera that came with the Pi to create our own smart doorbell. And so here's a general idea of how we're going to tackle this problem. Disclaimer here, there are multiple ways to tackle this problem and to achieve the same performance. Uh, but in this lecture, we'll take a look at one incarnation of that approach. So we want to create a method to determine if someone has approached our house. And in this lecture, we're going to use my house uh, as the test setup. So I want to know if someone or something has um, entered uh, a user-defined area. That user-defined area for me is going to effectively be my front porch. And I'll show you how we um, define that area of interest. If the system makes a detection, we want to go ahead and record an image, and we're actually going to record um, two images uh, in terms of detection, we'll record two images, and then we'll upload those as well for the user. I'll show you how to do that. So if we've got a detection, we'll record the images, we'll go ahead and record a, say, an X second long video here. I typically use something like 30 seconds. There are certainly more elegant uh, ways of determining how long to record the video. Uh, but again, in this lecture series, we're going to do kind of an introductory look at how we would tackle this smart doorbell with the Raspberry Pi. We also want to notify the user, and there's multiple ways to notify the user. We'll take a look at two. We'll send an email from the Raspberry Pi using an Internet of Things approach, and we'll also send a text message to the user using a Twilio account. And so then we want to provide the user with the image and the video. And so there's a couple ways to do that as well. Uh, in this lecture, we'll provide the image via email, and then we'll provide the video. Um, we'll upload the video to a Dropbox account. And again, you can think of many ways to tackle this and places to upload data and ways to contact the user, but I'll show you one incarnation here. And then most importantly, rinse and repeat, right? The idea with the smart doorbell is that it's on all the time, it's sort of constantly uh, operating and constantly watching and is prepared um, to notify the user and record all data um, that is uh, important, important being someone or something that has entered this user-defined area. So that's kind of the requirements of what we're doing, uh, what we're attempting to achieve with this system. So here then is an example of what some of the data looks like from uh, this smart doorbell. This is a Raspberry Pi with the original Raspberry Pi camera. And in my house, I have sort of a large bay window in my living room. And one of those windows gives me a really nice view of the um, sort of front stoop here uh, with the front yard and the street in front of me. So I sort of mount this camera um, inside the home, uh, looking through the window and doing the best I can to get sort of uh, a nice broad view of the scene here. The scene here, again, being the front of my house. And so this uh, recording has recorded me. I'm the uh, something of interest, right? Myself and my uh, dog, we walk out of the front door. Uh, the system is initialized saying, oh, we've detected something and goes ahead and generates that recording. Now I'll show you a bunch of examples throughout this lecture of um, other something or some ones uh, that have triggered this system. For example, you'll notice here, uh, this is the uh, male woman that came and delivered a package to our front door. And so as she approached the front door, that uh, she entered that user-defined area, we detected her presence, and we initiated that recording with the Raspberry Pi. Here then is a similar approach. Uh, what I've done here is replace the original Raspberry Pi camera, the physical uh, lens that's in the front of the standard Raspberry Pi camera, 
with a, a wider field of view lens, right? So the standard Raspberry Pi camera has a horizontal field of view of about 60 degrees. Um, I went ahead and bought sort of an, an aftermarket uh, lens, if you will, from another vendor, um, swapped that lens out, and this lens gives me a 110 degrees horizontal field of view. And so that's advantageous for this particular application. There are certainly um, advantages and disadvantages to going from narrow field of view lenses to wide field of view lenses for a, a host of applications. But for this particular application, the wide field of view lens is very advantageous because we get now a sort of a wider field of uh, the front of the house, right? So here's the narrow field of view lens. And then here is that wide field of view lens. Gives me, gives me sort of a better um, idea of the, uh, of the story here and what's happening uh, as someone enters that user defined area. So here's another example then, right? So here's the wide field of view lens on the Raspberry Pi camera. Um, we have uh, someone from Amazon uh, who came up and delivered a package uh, in front of our house. And as the um, Amazon employee was approaching the house, she entered that user defined area, the system detected that, and then went ahead and uh, generated this recording, right? And so we have the ability to uh, record information uh, to sort of track what's happening in front of the house. And, um, and then I receive notifications on my cell phone from both email and uh, Twilio, which is a text a message based program that we'll look at uh, to tell me, oh, okay, someone's here, and then I can go check the door um, and get my package, right? So, in both cases, the Raspberry Pi is mounted on a windowsill looking out the uh, uh, window here of the bay window and looking in front of the house. Let's take a step back then and talk about this concept of a smart home. I sort of alluded to this in the introduction to this lecture, but let's talk about this briefly, right? So the idea of the smart home is that there are certain tasks that can be automated, right? And the technology is now enabling us to automate some of these tasks. And most of the tasks that a smart home uh, is sort of, uh, you know, enabling are all controlled by these smart devices, primarily your cell phone or an iPad or some other tablet or equivalent. It's really becoming quite an ecosystem of automation. And I have a couple examples here, right? There are um, smart home devices and uh, applications that allow us to control our lighting uh, from other rooms or in theory, from anywhere in the world, right? If you have a true Internet of Things approach to the smart home, you can control any of these uh, components of the ecosystem from anywhere around the world, provided you have an Internet connection. So we can control lighting. We can control climate. In our house, we have a Nest thermostat. And so if I am on the couch or if I am um, upstairs laying in bed, I can actually change the uh, thermostat setting from our home right from my cell phone. It's really, really nice. On top of that, um, we, we have other devices that control entertainment systems, right? So we have a Google Home in our house. We actually have two of them, and the Google Home can control the TV, so we can tell Google to go ahead and, and, um, and control that device. There's a host of appliances that can be controlled uh, with these smart home devices. And then security is kind of the one we're going to be looking at in this lecture series, right? We're going to sort of dive deeper into one element of this ecosystem, that being security. And really, we're going to dive even deeper into one element of the security um, sort of sub ecosystem. We're going to look just at the smart doorbell. There's also other smart uh, security alarms, other um, CO2 detectors and all these other devices that are now all available and um, you know, sort of readily accessible by these Internet of Things approaches. So the smart doorbell really burst on the scene in 2013. Ring was the first company uh, to bring one of these smart doorbell devices to market. So that was, you know, roughly six, seven years ago. There's now a variety of other companies that have uh, entered the game, so to speak. Um, Google Nest uh, being one of the other more popular ones. But if you walk around a neighborhood nowadays, you'll see a host of uh, different smart doorbells, right? They're, they're really growing quite rapidly. And we're going to explore some of the reasons why, right? The technology is very advantageous. All of these devices typically offer some combination of video and audio, uh, video being probably the most important uh, bit of remotely sensed information, and then audio sort of complementing that 
uh, for a variety of applications. In this lecture series, we're, we're going to focus solely on video, although the Raspberry Pi does have some um, hooks in, let's say, for microphone input. How do they make their money, right? Well, typically the doorbells are, you know, $100, $200, but the recurring source of revenue are these paid subscriptions, right? So if you have a Ring doorbell, you can pay a monthly subscription fee. Um, varying amounts gives you varying amounts of data, and I think varying amounts of time that these um, uh, video and audio files are stored on their servers. So that's kind of the renewable um, you know, financial resource for the company, and it all sort of ties in with your Wi-Fi, right? You just pay the company, set up the Ring doorbell, uses your Wi-Fi to upload to their servers, and then all of their uh, algorithms and data processing software is on their servers. And so there's a real interest in um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, things like facial recognition, as I see here, et cetera, et cetera, uh, are really booming. And um, you know, one of the main reasons is they have the host of data to uh, explore with these different um, smart doorbell devices, right? And so it's a really nice intersection between um, sort of the decrease in size and power of computing devices, being able to put you know, small computers essentially into these doorbell sized devices. Um, so you have that nice, that hardware development and in kind of this intersection of the hardware and the software uh, with this boom of AI and machine learning, et cetera, uh, to actually churn through a process that data and do something with it in a usable and meaningful way. Here's one example then again, the ring doorbell looks like one of the earlier versions is about $100, right? That's just the hardware. Um, this is a battery-powered version. I'd have to look up the specs to see how long the battery lasts, but it'll notify the user, uh, I believe, when the battery is, um, is starting to drain, the battery is low. Um, but it's a relatively simple installation on the door, and then through the app, you kind of connect to that uh, ring doorbell, get it connected to your Wi-Fi, and then it talks uh, you know, ultimately to the server uh, that is part of the Ring company. Here's a couple examples then of uh, data that's come off of Ring doorbells. You've probably seen this or something similar in a lot of advertisements. Um, what's really interesting about Ring is they have the doorbell, they also have security cameras, right? And they're typically operating with, with similar um, software and algorithms. So if we take a look then at some of these examples, we'll see uh, the location of the mounting for the ring camera. Here's one that's sort of adjacent to the door, but maybe at a slight angle. Looks like this one's probably parallel with the door, looking straight out. Um, here's one that would be kind of orthogonal to the door at 90 degrees. You get you get kind of a view of the scene as well as what's going on with the door itself. And then here's one that is uh, presumably also mounted uh, sort of parallel with the door. And you'll notice they all have some sort of um, wide angle field of view lens. Uh, to try and capture as much of the scene as you can. You get kind of this fisheye effect, right? Where, where doors that we know are straight are actually looking like these curved uh, figures in the video, right? And the idea is uh, for a security camera, it makes sense for the wide angle field of view lens. You want to capture as much of the scene as possible. Uh, you see the pillars here kind of bent and that's an artifact of using these lenses. There's a couple examples of uh, PC Mag had a uh, PC Magazine had an article recently. It was their top 10 smart doorbells. And here's just a couple examples just to give you an idea of how much these are going for nowadays. There's quite a range, anywhere from $100 up to $250, all with different bells and whistles um, and different levels of um, you know data offerings, data products. But typically they're in the hundred to you know three hundred dollar range nowadays. That's just for the hardware. Again, sort of the renewable resource uh, from a financial standpoint it are these subscription packages that the different companies will offer you. So let's talk about setting up your Raspberry Pi. Then let's get into it. So here I have my camera. Uh, here's a Raspberry Pi with the camera. I have a simple three D printed mount uh, that it's all kind of tied into. Um, if you don't have a 3D printer, that's no problem. You can go ahead and just rig up something, right? You could just have the Raspberry Pi maybe sitting on the windowsill and rig up something, even if it's just duct tape and bubble gum, uh, just to get the camera stable and looking out the window. Um, or if you're going to do this directly on your front door, you could think about mounting it there as well. So go ahead and spend some time uh, during this lecture or immediately after thinking about where you would want to mount 
that camera and then go ahead and get that set up. I've gone ahead and put this uh, baby gate here uh, along um, the window sill here because we have a we have a dog who is always very curious what's happening at our front door. And so what you want to do with that in mind is when you mount your Pi and your camera, you want to make sure it's it's nice and rigidly mounted. You don't want anything moving. Uh, because that user-defined area that I alluded to earlier, that would effectively be changing if the camera is changing in terms of its mounting location or its angle. So once you get that mounted, go ahead and, and kind of secure that area, and then you'll be ready to continue. The next step, once your uh, Raspberry Pi and your camera is mounted, uh, we need to go ahead and sort of align that camera and make sure that we're getting a good view of the scene, right? And so I say here, use something like VNC viewer or a monitor for proper alignment. I'm going to go ahead and show you what that looks like using VNC viewer. And um, a monitor and keyboard would also work just fine, right? So the key here is that um, with something like putty or terminal, you wouldn't be able to view the images. So VNC viewer would be really advantageous for this exercise. So with VNC Viewer open here, I'll go ahead and bring up a terminal window. And again, I'm using um, VNC Viewer such that we can actually view the images here. That'll help us with alignment. Um, you could use a monitor or keyboard. Um, that would work just fine. And in this case, I'm actually connected to this Pi through the Wi-Fi here at home. Let's go ahead and take an image using Raspy Still. So this will be Raspy Still backslash w that'll be for width i'm going to go ahead and use 1280 uh, backslash h that'll be height i'll use 720 um, and then let's do a dash not backslash a dash o for open and we'll call this uh, smart doorbell alignment.jpg Okay. Now, one thing to, to sort of keep in mind is the uh, dimensions of images in this uh, exercise, right? As the image gets larger, as the dimensions of height and width get larger, so does the matrix that defines the image. And so the processing time goes up as well, right? And so you might be able to get by with something like a 640 by 480 image, uh, maybe play around with that a bit. In this lecture, I'm going to use 1280 by 720 uh, because that gives me um, some nice data. It works really well with the wide angle field of view lens uh, that's currently mounted on the Raspberry Pi here. Uh, but just something to keep in mind, if we're, if we're detecting something or someone in the user defined area, we want to do that as quick as possible. And so uh, that would sort of indicate we want smaller image sizes, but it's sort of this play between the ultimate data product, the quality of that and how quickly we can detect if something is there. So Raspy, sp Raspy Still, uh, dash W for width 1280, dash height, uh, dash H for height, 720, dash O, that'll be for open, and then smart doorbell alignment.jpg. Go ahead and run that bit of code. We're now recording an image. And then once that's finished recording, let's go ahead and open. So it'll be xdg dash open. Uh, and then we'll call smart doorbell. Should be able to just tab over and that'll auto complete. It's a little bash trick for you there. And let's take a look. Okay, so here is our image. Uh, looking out the windowsill, you'll notice it's flipped, right? It's upside down. This is because of the mount that I have for my Raspberry Pi and camera. The, the camera physically is actually mounted upside down. So we need to go ahead and flip that. So let's go back to Raspy Still. Just hit the up button. After our uh, width and height, let's go ahead and do a dash VF dash HF. Dash VF for vertical flip dash HF for horizontal flip. And that'll basically take that image that was upside down and flip it right side up for us. Go ahead and hit enter, run that bit of code, and just hit the up button, go ahead and open that image. And there you go. Now things are right side up and it looks like we're uh, properly aligned. We have a, a great view of the uh, front of the house. And you should go ahead and sort of iterate through this process until you're happy with the alignment of your image, and you get a nice view of your front front of your house. You can either do it through a window, or you could do it uh, you know, physically mount the camera uh, maybe on the front of the door or next to a windowsill or something like that until you're happy with the view that you have of the front of the home. As I mentioned before, then once everything is set up and aligned, go ahead as best you can and try and kind of 
you know, avoid that area or maybe um, uh, put some, some tape up or some notes to indicate to folks, try not to disturb your setup because you really want that camera to be locked in and stable for the duration of this lecture series. And so that's kind of what my uh, data looks like now in terms of the alignment. I could tweak this a little bit. You know, if I move the camera left, I'd get a little bit better view of the mailbox and, and the street here. If I did a little bit further right, uh, I actually really wouldn't see much more because it's just the brick in the home. So you want to go ahead and just align that as best you can. Here then are some of the camera specs for the Raspberry Pi camera. In this lecture, I'll be recording at uh, 1280 by 720, so width of 1280 by a height of 720. Um, but as I was mentioning earlier, if you wanted to speed up the processing a bit, you could go down to 640 by 480. And again, as the um, image size decreases, um, so would the processing time, uh, because the image is effectively a matrix, right, that has to be processed uh, by your computer. In terms of the different lenses that I've presented here in the lecture. Here is the original 62 degree horizontal field of view. This is the original or sort of standard lens that comes with the Raspberry Pi camera. Um, I had replaced the standard 62 degree field of view lens with a wide field of view lens. This is 110 degrees. That opens up the field of view, allows me to see a little bit more kind of the entire front yard of the house. And I like that, but it is an aftermarket part. So you'd have to go to somewhere like Blue Robotics here and purchase that component. So there's an expense associated with that increase in performance. Here's what that looks like again in terms of the data. And you notice you get a wider field of view, obviously with the 110 degree lens, um, which I find to be quite nice for this type of exercise. And if you go back and think about the ring data samples that we looked at earlier, you'll notice that they all have wide field of view lenses as well. So let's talk about the detection pipeline now. In this pipeline, we're going to grab, a record a first image, and then grab or record a second image. We'll mask both of those images, and then we'll compare the first and second image. And we'll say if a detection is made, if some threshold is achieved, go ahead, kick off and record an X second video. We'll use a 30 second video in this example. Um, then we'll upload that video to Dropbox. We'll email the images to the user, and then we'll also send them a text message via Twilio. And then rinse and repeat, right? So there's some notion of looping here just to continue this 24 hours a day, seven days a week, such that we can record anytime someone or something enters that user defined area. Here again is the example of the Amazon employee delivering a package to our front door. And what we want to start to work on now is what is that user defined area, right? And so this will be different uh, depending on how the camera is set up, depending on um, how the house is laid out. But for my home, I've essentially defined the front stoop and maybe the first or second step here in front of the house as the user defined area, right? And so if someone or something enters that area, in this case, the Amazon worker was coming up from the road. Um, you'll see that her, looks like her foot and part of her uh, ankle and leg here, uh, enter that user defined area. That went ahead and met that detection criteria. And so we went ahead and we started to uh, record, right? And so what we're gonna work on now is defining this user defined area in terms of pixel coordinates, and then creating a mask that is specific to the operating environment, such that our detection algorithm is only triggered when something or someone enters a user-defined area, not when we have things like cars driving down the street, or maybe some kids at play in the front yard, et cetera. And if you have one of these smart doorbells, these commercially available doorbells, and you log in with their app, most often they'll ask you to define a region of interest such that their detection algorithm will only register when someone or something enters that user-defined area, right? So each house is different, each setup for the camera is different, and so you need to be able to define this user-defined area. So let's go ahead and jump in and start working on some code. We're going to um, load in an image, and then we're going to use the cv2.selectroi. That's for select region of interest. And that'll help us identify the points defining the boundary of our mask. 
To begin, I'll go ahead and exit out of PowerPoint and let's open up for now an Anaconda prompt. We'll go ahead and use Anaconda to load an image and then work and define the uh, points, the array of points that define the boundary of our mask. Once we have those points defined, we'll then just port that over to the Raspberry Pi. Let's go ahead and activate Pi Steve. And I'm now in my Python virtual environment. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just use a notepad for the code here today. So I'll go ahead and save this file. And let's just call it uh, smart doorbell masking.py. Make sure if you're using notepad that you save it as a .py file, not a .py txt file and then for my computer I need to save it in C users Steve so I'll go ahead and save that to begin let's import the packages that we're going to use for this exercise so let's import numpy as NP again that'll be the NP alias let's import CV2 and import I am you Hills for this particular exercise. And let's go ahead now and read in an image. So what you want to do is grab that image, either um, FTP it to yourself or uh, Cyberduck or um, Gmail. Grab that image, that alignment image from your Raspberry Pi and camera. Once it's all set up and, and kind of locked in place, go ahead and grab that image, bring it over to your laptop, and then uh, we'll go ahead and read in that image. So let's go down here. I'll say read in image, and let's go ahead and call that. Uh, I'm just going to give it a name of test one, and we'll say cv2.imread. Uh, I have an image here called ring test image .image jpg on my machine, so I'll read that in. And let's just go ahead and show that to the screen. So cv2.im show. This will be the original, and that'll be test one. And then of course we need a wait key. So cv2.wait key of zero. Save that and then we'll go ahead and run it, right? So let's go back over to Anaconda. This will be Python, smart doorbell. If I tab over it, that should finish for me. And I'll go ahead and execute that file. And we see the results here, right? So we've loaded in that original alignment image and we're just displaying that to the screen. But that's good exercise. Let's just confirm then that we like the alignment of our image. This is a good one. I've got a nice view of the front of the house. Uh, I can see into the street. So I can not only detect when someone enters this user defined area, I can also get a good idea of uh, you know, when they leave or where they go. For example, with the Amazon worker, I was able to see the, the van that she was driving. So um, you know, again, I'm using the wide angle uh, lens here. And so I've positioned my Raspberry Pi camera accordingly. If you're using the standard lens, no problem. Just go ahead and get sort of the best view that you can for your particular user defined area. So let's hit any key to get out of that script. But now let's go ahead and explore the use of this cv2.select ROI, select region of interest for this particular application. If I run this script again, before I do that, if I run this script again, the idea here is I want to select the points. I want to know the XY coordinates of the pixels that define that region of interest. If I quickly look back at this PowerPoint here, right? Effectively, I want to know what's this pixel coordinate, what's this pixel coordinate, this one, this one, right? I want to define this array such that I can create this mask, right? And I can essentially mask out everything else except this user defined region, right? And one could do that by kind of going through by trial and error and finding all of these uh, points, that is rather inefficient. And so we're going to use this select ROI function to make this a little bit more efficient in terms of defining these uh, pixel coordinates. So let's go ahead and jump in. So I'm going to create a function here. I'll call this uh, define mask image. It'll take an image file. And for the time being, we're going to simply uh, examine this select ROI function. So I'm going to say B box for bounding box, that's equal to cv2.select ROI. 
I'll pass it the image file and I have a flag here that we'll call false. I'll explain that in just a second. And then we'll print bbox to the screen. So I need to come down here and after test one, I'll call gray one. I actually have to pass test one, this image, this alignment image, I have to pass it through the function that is uh, mask image, right? So mask image will pass test one. Let's go ahead and run that real quickly. And you'll notice here, I'll uh, click anywhere on the screen, right? I'm in the ROI selector. If you look at the caption, I'll click anywhere on the screen, hold my mouse down and drag, and then I'll let go, okay? And I've now drawn a uh, rectangle of arbitrary dimensions in the ROI selector screen here. Now what Bounding Box is going to do with this setup is it's going to tell me the XY coordinates of the beginning of the box, and then it's going to tell me the width of the box, comma, the height of the box, all in pixels, right? So if I go ahead and hit the space bar, I'll complete the cv2.select ROI call. I'll run through the script. I've left the cv2.im show running. So this is that original image. So let's hit any key to get out of there. And you'll notice here's our results, right? So here we have that initial top left of the box was at 121 for X, 203 for Y with a width and height, right? Um, if I run this again, right, if I were to select, uh, let's say all the way over here on the left, that'll be a pixel coordinate of zero or one, right? And draw, drag this box, say, uh, a really high aspect ratio. Uh, we should have a beginning X coordinate close to zero or one, a Y coordinate, I don't know, roughly a hundred, right? Um, a width of maybe 100 or less than 100 and then quite quite a noticeable uh, height here. So let's hit the space bar, we'll hit Q to get out original. And there we go, right? We see the original uh, coordinate is at zero. It's basically on the left side of the image, 141 for the Y. Remember that uh, images, the zero, zero coordinate origin is always up here in the top left. And then we have 82, that's the width, and then a height of, uh, in this case, 515 pixels, right? And I've put the links here. I posted the links in the PowerPoint if you wanted to take a look at the uh, cv2.select ROI function with a little bit more detail, right? Um, it takes an input image. There's some flags here. You can, uh, if, if we switch that false flag to true, we could show the crosshairs. Um, and then if we did a comma true again, the box would actually grow from the center of the box, whereas right now it's growing from that top left corner, right? So there are some different uh, functionalities, some different capabilities that go into the cv2.select ROI function. But what we're going to do is to use the cv2.select ROI, we're going to pick these points, right? Kind of dynamically select them. We'll have them printed to the screen. And then once we're finished with that functionality, we'll go ahead and record those and put them into the array that defines our mask. So with that in mind then, let's add some iterative capability to this script here. We'll say for i in range. And here's where you have to decide about how many points you think it will take to define your mask, right? In this example here, I have uh, roughly 11 points. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10 it looks like, 10 points. And so as I was working through this exercise, I had to change this number a couple times. Uh, so 11, maybe you have, I don't know, 15, however many points. Let's go ahead and do it for four points just uh, to illustrate this example. And what we'll do is we'll perform this functionality, um, in this case, 0, 1, 2, 3, or four times. Uh, so let's go ahead and save the script and run the script in Anaconda. Okay, so here is our region of interest selector. And for example, if I were to select, um, let's select a point up here, hit the space bar, it's gonna run again. Point up here, hit the space bar, point up here and down here, I guess, right? That would give me the four points. Uh, it continues to show the original to the screen. And now if I look, when I ran the script, um, it gave me the, co the, the coordinates of this bounding box four times, right? So the starting X, starting Y, and then the width and the height. And so all we're really interested in are the starting X and starting Y coordinates of this 
bounding box or region of interest functionality. So what we can do with that is we can add some efficiency to the process by dynamically selecting the points, right? So I, if I were doing this uh, uh, in reality, I'd kind of select this point as part of my mask, maybe by the front door, I'd come down here, over here, and I'd build that mask up. I'd build up all those points such that I had basically all the vertices of this mask, right? So I had the X, Y locations of this pixel, X, Y of this pixel. I had an array that allowed me to build up and define that mask. So based on your particular setup then, you go ahead and define how many times you'd like to run through this select ROI functionality. Then once you're done, go ahead and record all of your pixel coordinates, okay? I'm going to go ahead and move on to uh, defining that array. I've gone through iteratively and selected all of my points. Then we'll move on to the next step now, which is defining the array and actually creating the mask. So because I've gone through that process, I'm going to go ahead and comment out this functionality. And inside define mask now, I'll go ahead and define this array of points. So here I have points equals np.array. And these points, again, will be specific to my setup, right? So your setup might be slightly different, uh, but I'll go ahead and punch in all these numbers now. Okay, so here are the points I've defined as the vertices of my polygonal mask. Again, they'll be different for your array. And to go ahead now and fill this polygon, we need to first take a step back. We need to go up here and actually define our mask, right? So we'll say mask equals mp.zeros, and we'll use the input image dimensions to create this blank mask. So that'll be img.shape of zero, comma img.shape of one. Let's make this a little bit wider so that we can see what we're doing here. Comma, uh, we start with the parenthesis, and then comma, the data type, we'll go ahead and define that as an unsigned 8-bit integer. Number 8 bits, that's 2 to the 8 or 256 values, so that would be 0 to 255 on grayscale. Okay, so we've now defined our mask. It'll be the same dimensions as the input image. That's our alignment image. For me, it's this ring test image. And it will effectively be a solid black mask because it's going to be all zeros, right? MP.0 is an array of zeros, which in grayscale, zero is solid black. Now we can go ahead and fill in this convex polygon with cv2.fill convex poly. We'll fill a mask with the points array, and everything inside of these vertices will fill as 255. Okay. Let's go ahead and mask that image. We'll say masked equals CV2. We'll perform a bitwise and. Bitwise underscore and. We'll pass image, comma image. We'll say mask equals mask. And then for the time being, let's just go ahead and return masked from this function. Right? So we have a function, we create a mask of zeros, we've defined our points, and we dynamically identify those points with the select ROI. We fill the convex polygon, mask it, and return it to the screen. And gray one will be that masked image. So instead of original, let's go ahead and uh, we'll, we'll do both of them. Let's show the original and let's show the masked image. I'll call it gray one. And let's show both of those to the screen. Let's go ahead and run that script. Okay, here's our original image. Let's see, original alignment image. And I've gone ahead and created the following mask. Now, I've only masked off kind of the, the front stoop of the house. What you'll find is you have to be a little bit careful, right? If, if I mask off the steps here as well, um, this cv2.fill convex polygon, it really likes an array of points that is kind of a nice polygon in, in the sense that it can create a nice perimeter for that polygon. Sometimes if you start having uh, your geometries up here, almost like U-shaped, uh, you'll, you'll find up some issues of overlap and whatnot. So I'm going to perform my masking in two steps. I'm actually going to create a mask that is kind of the front step, or the front stoop of the house, and then I'm going to add to the mask the 
uh, the smaller steps, if you will, the walkway up to my front door. So I'll go ahead and go back to my script. And what I'm going to do is add in another array. So we'll say points equals mp.array. And I'll go in and add another array of points that defines the front steps, that sort of walkway up to the house, right? So we'll do uh, 553 comma 707. And I'll type in the rest of the values here, defining that mask as well. Okay, so here I am. I have now the points that define the walkway up to the front steps, and I go ahead and add them into the mask. You'll notice I have two cv2.fill convex poly calls, right? So if I mask the image now, let's go ahead and save it. Let's go back and run that script. Now you'll notice I've masked off the front stoop and sort of the walkway or, or some part of the walkway leading up to the front steps. Now, the other thing we want to do in this mask image function is to go ahead and convert this image to grayscale. Uh, that'll allow us to compare two images for a, for a detection algorithm in only one color scale or one zero to 255 array. So we'll convert everything to grayscale. We'll also resize the image. If we shrink this 1280 by 720 image down to something smaller, we could make that comparison on a much smaller array. That'll help speed up our processing a bit. And then lastly, let's go ahead and, and blur this image to help account for some noise effect. So let's go ahead and do that now. So I'll say gray equals cv2.convert color, and we'll convert masked from cv2.color. Uh, we'll convert it from BGR to grayscale. Remember, OpenCV operates in the BGR space, not the RGB. We'll convert that from a three channel to a one channel over to the grayscale. We'll say gray equals cv2.gaussian blur. Uh, we'll blur gray, give it a kernel size. Uh, I'll start with 11 by 11. Feel free to play around with that and see if you can optimize a particular kernel size for your application. And then let's return then grayscale, uh, the grayscale blurred image to the script. So let's go ahead and run that, save it, run it. And here you go, right? Here's our original image. We've masked off spatially such that we're only looking at the front of the house. Uh, we've converted it to grayscale. We're now in one channel and we went ahead and blurred to help reduce the impact of noise in our detection algorithm. And then the last thing I'll do is add in this functionality here just to resize the image. Uh, so we'll do an I see gray equals imutils.resize. Uh, we'll resize masked and we'll give it a width, something really small, it's so like 200. And we could toy around with this as well in terms of our detection algorithm. The idea is we're going to compare two images. If we go back to the uh, PowerPoint slides here, in terms of the detection pipeline, we're going to grab the first image and mask it, but then we're going to compare both of those images. So if the images are smaller, that'll reduce the processing time. Of course, as the images are smaller, then we need a larger something or someone entering the user-defined area to actually meet that detection threshold. So there are some trades to be evaluated there, but we'll uh, resize it to a width of 200 for the time being. Let's save it and run it. And it looks like mass was not resized. Well, let's take a look what happened there. We resized mass, we we'll called it gray, and then we went in gray and convert color, right? So there's a, there's a typo there or a um, compile error. So let's go ahead and convert gray, which is the resized version of mask, save it and run it and there we go right so there's our original image we've resized it we've masked it we have converted it to grayscale and blurred it and so these are the two images this is obviously one image we would compare a next image as well these are the two images that will be compared uh, to decide if we've met that detection threshold that detection criteria so that wraps up part one of the Smart Doorbell Lecture Series. Go ahead and work through all of the items in this lecture. And we will continue, we'll pick up in part two of the Smart Doorbell Lecture Series. We'll talk about how we actually grab the image. We're going to use uh, some time-lapse functionality to take two images. And we can sort of define how quickly we take them and all their dimensions and everything. We'll get into that next lecture, and then we'll start to dive into the detection algorithm itself, how we actually say, hey, someone or something entered that user
defined area. Then in future lectures, we'll talk about uh, the Internet of Things approaches to upload the video to, to Dropbox using Twilio uh, and then email as well. So thanks for following along. As always, reach out anytime with questions, comments, or ideas. And I'll see you for part two of this Smart Doorbell lecture series.